Well, um, the first thing for me in the book was a therapy. Mm. Writing the book was a therapy. I tell my um, co-writer, Carol, that she was my therapist. And the reason why we took so long, we started 2008 and we didn't finish the 2010. Mm -hmm. Not that it was a difficult book to write, but it was a difficult journey for me to take. There were times that I would get to a particular place in this writing and I would stop because I would get re-traumatized. Mm -hmm. And then I have to go through the process of healing. But there will also come a time in this book where something in my past will make a lot of sense to me. And I'll sit down and do my own analysis. I'll give you an example. Growing up with five daughters of our mother, and we felt she was a very hard person. She would beat us, she would do this. But as I wrote this book, it dawned on me that here is someone who was rejected at five by her own mother. She married when she was a child. She was 16 when she had her first child. She married someone who was very social, and she was not, but someone who also cheated. So she lived in her own trauma, and it wasn't that she hated us. Today, as a feminist, I realized that she just had her own issues. And so at that point, I stopped, and I had to forgive myself for ever thinking that this woman hated us, but also get to the place where I now understand that she too has her own trauma that she's never really dealt with. So it was a therapy for me. But coming back to your question, I, I have gotten women come to me and say, after I read your book, I sat down and re-evaluated my life. And I'm taking this decision because of where I find myself. So beyond helping me, I'm hoping that it can help people to see some of the challenges and when I wrote the book, I never imagined that I would win the Nobel Peace Prize. We, the book came out one month. As a matter of fact, the day of the Nobel announcement was the last day of my book tour. I was ending tour. And so I was the last person practically on the face of this earth that knew I had won the prize. Because I just stepped off a plane like five hours after the prize was announced. So I didn't think I would win to be profiled globally like this, and maybe God has its way, you know, we say he has a sense of humor, that if I probably had the price, I would want to be a bit diplomatic. But at the time, this was a grassroots activist telling her story. And today, people reading this book will say, this is the life of the Nobel Peace Prize winner. And if everything is there, why don't I want to work on this particular issue? But it's a, it's a personal story that also, I think it's also political because the person is political. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in this book that is not the issue of women today. You have the issue of refugee women in here, the issue of single mother, the issue of alcohol and drug abuse, the issue of domestic violence. All of the issues of women that are political and that communities do not want to address are the issues that you find in this book. So the person is obviously political. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's truly an honor for me to be here um, at the premiere of what is this book, Mighty Be Our Powers. Um, I was passing through, and usually that's the problem with being a Nobel laureate. You don't pass through without being noticed. You have to, if you want to pass through quietly, don't let anyone know that you are coming to a place. So I'm actually here because I was going to Duville for a women's forum and then my assistant said, the publishing people heard you be in Duville. Can you do the book thing in Paris before going to Duville? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this book and is a story that speaks about my life and the drive to write this book actually came after the documentary on our protests in Liberia, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, was done in 2008. 
And then the producer of the documentary said, the story is bigger than this 60 minute documentary. Why don't you write a book? And I said, I don't have the time because my life is fighting for issues of women's rights and peace. And the time that I will sit for six months to a year, there will be issues that will claim my attention that I need to work on. And she said, why don't we do it in a way that you write it at your own pace and we find someone to work with you. And then I said, well, if we have to write a book, I want to write a book that is honest. I want to write a book that speaks to the situation of women everywhere. I want to write a book that is a story of tragedy and pain, but also is loaded with triumph. I don't want to write the usual begging bold children on the back, sagging breast African woman story. I want to depict the true picture of us African women, a picture of women globally that we go through a lot, but at the end of the day, we always come out triumphant. But I also want to write a book that is simple, not filled with too many terminologies that can also speak to young girls. So tell them that in life you will fall, but that is not what your character will be judged by. You will be judged by how you get up and how you are able so to move. Since we did the book, we've done, there have been many translations, um, um, Italian, Spanish, um, Swedish, Unfortunately, all of those translations that have been done, I haven't gone to any of the launch of the book, and I'm happy to be in France to do this one with your fun. But the, rate, the <clears throat> one we've gotten the reviews from the book, especially from women in different communities, is that I meet rich women in New York who tell me, this book spoke to me, it is my story. And then I meet women in countries that are going through conflict and they tell me this is my story. And I feel fulfilled because if this is a book that speaks to women everywhere, but also meet with young girls and they say to me, Madam Bowie, we want to thank you because usually people write books and they don't write their shortcomings in the book. But you were honest to put in your fight with alcohol and to put in all of the problems with your relationship, that was very brave. And I thought, when you say you're brave in fighting for peace and social justice, you also have to be brave to let the world know that you too have some demons in your closet that you have to fight every day. But this book has also made it a, a a mandate, a continuous mandate for me to lend my voice to continuing to fight for women's rights globally. So from the fight to including women at the peace table, to the <coughs> fight of sexual exploitation and abuse in schools, to finding solutions for problems with reproductive health and rights <coughs> in communities where we have issues, those are the things that I continue to do in my life, added with the fact that the book will contribute one euro, one dollar euro, one euro to, on every purchase to my foundation, is to provide educational opportunity for girls who I see, like myself, immense challenges in their communities, but are determined to go to school, and we take those girls we started since February, the foundation. We started with four today. We have 30 on our scholarships and we provide everything. Four, four years, you have, your parents have nothing to worry about. And we have students in school in Ghana, in US, and Liberia. We will add, continue to add the number of, but this is just where I find myself today and I'm happy to be here and happy to take questions even if you want to wrap up my love life.
Well, um, my relationship with President Sterling, if you read in the book, I was very honest that from the get-go, I didn't think she was the person for Liberia because of the allegations of her involvement <coughs> in the war and the contributions that she made. I autographed a copy of my book. I gave it to her. She read it. And I asked what was her impression. She said, we have to talk. <laughs> um, we haven't had the time to talk yet about the book, but she felt like it was generally was a very good book. That was what she said to me. She said, Lima, I think you need to bring your book into the country. She has done a book also so that your book and my book could be read to girls in different schools so that they see the stories of our lives and where we have come. Um, I always did my work from the grassroots. I, I pride myself in the fact that I don't need government to function because the needs are great. I don't have to be um, politically aligned to anyone in order to do what I do. As a matter of fact, it's going to be in my interest if I'm not politically aligned to anyone in order to do my work because I work at the community level and I have never in my life taken any money from government um, to do what I do. Today, it was by the grace of God that I got the prize and with the price now, I'm thinking, what do I do? And not so most people say, so politically, are you involved? Um, I've been asked by the president to lead the national reconciliation process, but that is a process that has a lot of challenges that I seem that seems not to be going anywhere. So we're in a conversation about me stepping out of that role. I don't think I want to um, continue to play. At that national level, I want to I want to do my work at the grassroots level. Um, so it, we 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 have a relationship. I have an I have access to her office as a Nobelist. Um, we I go there to share stuff. One of the things that I recognized from the beginning, even before the price, was that governments have structures and institutions but they are not very functional. So when you go into communities, there have been communities that I go into to work with girls and the statistics of girls finishing school or the statistics of girls pregnant or the statistics of abuse and exploitation is not coming to the attention of the government. So one of the things I do now is every time I get a report from the field, from my staff, once we validate, I personally sit at my computer and do a special copy of that report with all of the human interest story, take it to the president's office, hand it to her and say, this is your bedtime story, read it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that kind of access is good for me. I'm not going because I want something. I, I feel like I'm at a unique place where I work in a community and I'm able to take the stories from the community to national government and take the stories from national government at the international level. Is everything okay in Liberia? I would give President Sirleaf a 75% average. She has done well in terms of trying to bring back the basic infrastructure. But we all know that there are certain menace in governments that we need to work on. And one of the biggest problems of Liberia is corruption. And until we can tackle the problems of corruption in our country, we will continue to see the disparities. But on the average, we, like, we have few laws that we can say is on the track of good governance. We have the Freedom of Information Act. We have a rape law now. We have different things that points in the right direction. But when it comes to the economic issue, the economic disparity, and the corrupt practices, and the failure to really prosecute the way the public would like to see. It's not good enough to prosecute a man down there when there are allegations of the minister being corrupt and nothing is happening. So that's the only problem. I think a major problem we have here. Well, to answer your question, when it comes to disappointment, it's not just one way. I mean, I went back home from the Clinton Global Initiative and from the General Assembly um, stuff that we had to do there. 
And first someone went to Liberia and called and said, Lima, why do we have so many angry young people? And the answer is simple because the hope that they had is being dashed before their eyes. And you go back to Monrovia and tell people the way to navigate dealing with some of these issues. Don't ask anyone, how are you? And bonjour, it's fine. No sava. Because once you say sava, you've opened up a whole Pandora box for complaints, um, some you cannot address. So people are generally disappointed. I'm disappointed because people are disappointed. Um, it, it's, we work hard for the peace. Mm -hmm. And we know what led Liberia, like I said earlier, to where we find ourselves. Um, people who had always been dissatisfied with the system of government, the structure, President Sergei herself, in her days as a political advocate and activist, she was upset with the Togo regime for the appointment of his brothers and relatives into positions. Today we've seen the same things happen. Um, the appointment of sons on the board of the oil company as deputy of the central bank. People are generally disappointed. In the first term, she did, like I said, when it comes to infrastructure development, they've done well in terms of trying to bring Liberia back to light. But those little things that easily he sets or uh, uh, put aside, um, the development of a nation should be tackled. And those things should be tackled by tackling corruption and some of the, um, this, the, the disappointment that people have. So there is that general feeling of disappointment. I'm sad as a Liberian, as an activist, because you see a lot of sadness in people. So it makes you sad. Am I under a lot of pressure? Yes, private conversations. People think that I'm aligned to the president so they don't hear me speaking loud enough about some of these issues. Every day I have to I, I go home with phone calls, even here, that you, you need to say something, you need to say something. Um, we have a deficit when it comes to moral voice in our country. We have no one that anyone can say this is the moral voice of the country. So that is also a serious problem. You don't need to ask the question of whether if we continue in that trend, it's good for the peace and stability of Liberia. No country that is that has corruption as a major problem can even imagine that peace and stability will reign unless you tackle those things because those are serious recipe for crisis and it has to be tackled, especially where you have a shrinking bit or you do not have a middle class or middle income population. It's either you're rich or you're dirt poor. You know, that is recipe for disaster. The third and final thing on that question is that whilst infrastructure development, they've been trying to bring it up. Development in a population of hungry, angry people means nothing. So one mistake, because the development is not connected to a large population of the people, when they get angry, they'll burn it down because they don't see how it's going to benefit them. So that's another issue. So we have a responsibility, whether we like it or not, um, to speak the truth uh, and to say a lot of things. And I, I feel like... Um, at some point, I have been a disappointment also to myself and to the Liberian people because um, not speaking is also as bad as being a part of some of the systems that have taken place and that I'm choosing to do this in France. I'll probably be called a coward because I should be home and doing this. But this is where the opportunity presented itself and probably when we go back home, this conversation is something that we intend to continue.